Some people were impressed by this performance, but have you ever wondered what it would have looked like if it were a competition in stupidity? Take it away, Dylan. This is insane. A California startup is currently working on selling sunlight to people at night by using mirrors on satellites to reflect sun rays down to earth. It's simplicity, it's bold, stark lines. Pray, what do you call it? The light switch. <laughs> the light switch. Yes. Just imagine it like Uber Eats for sunlight. By using their planned constellation of 57 small satellites. I couldn't buy it then. Not really. I needed to turn the lights on and off. Hypothetically, <laughs> it's midnight, but you want to tan in your back garden. You simply order 30 minutes of sunlight on the Reflect Orbital app. Except, no. That's roughly where low Earth orbit is. And this is where midnight is, and this is where midday is. So, to reflect sunlight from here to midnight will require the sunlight going through several thousand kilometers of solid rock. It's midnight, but you want to tan in your back garden. You simply order 30 minutes of sunlight on the Reflect Orbital app, grab some sunscreen and a cold one, head outside, and then minutes later, you're cooking. Or, let's say you own a solar farm, but at night, you make no money. By ordering sunlight when it's dark, it would allow for endlessly available and sustainable power. I have placed in orbit a giant mirror that will reflect 40% of the sun's rays, thus cooling Earth. But what if we put mirrors into space, not to reflect more light energy away away from the Earth to counter global warming. Problem solved. But what if someone finally worked out a way to shine that extra light onto the Earth to enhance global warming? <laughs> we we kind of come in as this other solution where it's like, okay, look, we have these billion dollar solar farms. They're gigantic. They're out in the desert. They make a ridiculous amount of power during the day. What if that didn't stop when the sun went down? What if all the sunlight that was missing the Earth could just come down and... And then the other piece is the satellites work together. So one spot is actually a composite of like 100 or so satellites at one time. Oh, that's a little bright. The two founders of Reflect Orbital believe that sunlight is the new oil. And yes, they are kind of literally correct there in that they've turned solar into a way which actually directly causes global warming. Next year. And they even opened up applications for sunlight to be delivered in Q4 2025 for a duration of four minutes and a diameter of five kilometers. <laughs> so do not apply if you have neighbors. Oh boy, if this wasn't something that you could debunk with a $1.50 beauty mirror and a pre-high school knowledge of geometry. Let's just for a minute imagine a future where this works and you can buy sunlight at night. On the one side, it could revolutionize sustainable energy production. And by dramatically lowering the cost of electricity, you would also lower the cost of other crucial things. And this is where our hero just lets it go completely and goes full performative stupidity on us. And by dramatically lowering the cost of electricity, you would also lower the cost of other crucial things. Like manufacturing, food production, transportation, healthcare, etc. Wow! The land of make-believe! Yeah, we actually already have a giant orbital reflector of sunlight. It's called the moon. And surprisingly, it's not made electricity generation any cheaper. It doesn't allow solar farms to run constantly through the night. So really, the question you should be asking is, what would be the cost of an orbital array that could generate significant amounts of power? And we'd need all the money on Earth to be... What the? But it damn well better work. We can't spend all of Earth's money every day. Or you could ramble about some really, really dumbass things. But on the flip side, there could be unintended consequences for disrupting Earth's natural cycles, environmental impacts, and even economic disparities where endless sunlight is a privilege that only the rich could afford. Either way, it is an absolutely fascinating idea that I'll keep my eye on. So there's this brilliant idea that no one's ever thought of before. What if we put solar panels on cars? Then we could run our cars as long as there is sunlight. It would be free, unlimited transport. And by dramatically lowering the cost of electricity, you would also lower the cost of other crucial things. I even built this solar-powered car just to show it's entirely possible to build a full-sized car because I built this little one. Ah, but there'll be people saying, 
Yes, but that's great when the sun is shining. But what when the sun isn't shining? When it's dark? Now, none of your cars will work. But I've got a brilliant solution to this. What if we put mirrors into space? Then we could run our solar cars at any point on Earth just by using reflected sunlight from space. But wait, what if rather than spending, say, $5 on a cheaper solar-powered electric car and a mirror and a demonstration that lasts a full 10 seconds, you know, to show that mirrors work, a really controversial point. What if rather than doing that, you could spend months and hundreds of thousands of dollars to prove the exact same point that uh, mirrors work? But getting down to basically what we're making as quickly as possible, which is a spot of light on the ground, the balloon test was the way to do that. What if we put mirrors? It was like three months of just not really sleeping at all. <laughs> like driving out to the desert. Like, I think we spent... Into space. The thing still didn't work, like when we were getting the hot air balloon ready. Then we could run our solar cars. And like, you know, that's the huge flame on that. And everybody's there to watch it and see it work. And it's like, just sitting there writing code. Just by using reflected sunlight. I think it's gonna come together. It was, it was insane. It was definitely the craziest, most manual labor thing I've had to do, combined with the craziest amount of engineering. Oh, we got a flash! All right, these are very noticeable spikes. So there's Tristan standing in a sunbeam. Ah! Dude, it's literally working! Yeah. Woo! Ah! Dude, it's literally working! Okay, so they did an unbelievably stupid experiment to demonstrate that mirrors work. Physics to make this work, we're not inventing some crazy new piece of engineering. Um, this is very much like we have to design the right thing and explore the design space. But there's an even more fundamental reason as to why this whole idea is gargantuanly stupid. Which, yes, again, can be demonstrated with a dollar beauty mirror. Reflect is the kind of company that inspired me to start S3. Small teams of motivated people coming up with unique and crazy solutions to important problems. Fine, let's see how long this survives contact with reality and a dollar beauty mirror. So your main problem with this, of course, is just geometry in that when you reflect sunlight, like that, there's my reflected sunlight, a nice little square when there's not much distance between the mirror and where the sunlight is being projected to. And so you'll notice that the the car takes up basically the entire area of the reflected light at eh, half a meter or something. Yeah, but what happens when we go from about half a meter to several meters away? Now when we zoom in. So now we're a few meters away and the car won't run on the edges of the reflected light. It'll run in the center still, but you see that what was initially focused basically entirely on the car at a half meter or so, at a couple of meters, it's now diluted by maybe a factor of four or so. And it's just crazy that with their balloon demo, that's literally all they prove what sunlight looks like when it's reflected off a flat mirror. This success gave the team confidence in reflection-based power transmission to solar panels. Wow, they were so happy with their conclusion that mirrors work that they didn't look at the obvious implications of reflecting light some 500 kilometers away. Now, if you look at the sun and measure its angular size, you'll see that it's not a point source. It's about half a degree in diameter. Now, you can't actually sensibly show angles that small in a video like this, so I've exaggerated the angle to about three degrees. This angle here is about six times bigger than the angular size of the sun. So now if I let that light shine through a pinhole, it'll diverge at exactly the same rate of about half a degree or so. Or if we were to shine it off a point source mirror, then also the divergence of that light will be about half a degree. Now let's say, for instance, that that mirror is 500 kilometers in altitude, the typical altitude of a satellite in low Earth orbit. 
we can calculate the size of the projected spot as being some five kilometers in diameter. And a diameter of five kilometers. So all of the light from that point source will be spread over five kilometers. But what if it's not quite a point source, but say a 10 meter by 10 meter satellite? Yeah, we, you can pack a 10 meter by 10 meter reflector into something that's about this size. Which, yes, at 500 kilometers, 10 meters by 10 meters is still effectively a point source of light for anyone on the ground. So now you're spreading the light that would land on 10 meters by 10 meters over roughly 5,000 meters by 5,000 meters. Roughly how much dim is this going to be? Well, you're taking 100 square meters of sunlight and spreading it over 25 million square meters of ground which means it's going to be, give or take, a quarter of a million times fainter than sunlight. Hypothetically, it's midnight, but you want to tan in your back garden. You simply order 30 minutes of sunlight on the Reflect Orbital app. And then get something that's a quarter of a million times fainter than sunlight for four minutes. You know, because that's how long it takes the satellites to whiz over at an orbital type velocity. Yeah, on the scale of things, there might be more practical solutions. The light switch. <laughs> Yes. Now there are intrinsic problems with a spot size of five or so kilometers. So this is from their actual website where we can see that the spot size would basically cover the entire of Manhattan. And that's the minimum size spot that you're going to be able to get. Now if we zoom out a bit on their app, you'll notice something rather strange. That New York seems to have solved the problem of getting light at night. In fact, Dave from EEV Blogs did a video on this where he goes through the calculations and works out that's not even the energy threshold cutoff for generating power from solar panels. You get five milliwatts per square meter. Milliwatts. As I mentioned before, this is completely useless. Just the residual power to run the inverters is going to be more than this. But what if we put two satellites and focus both of their spots on the same area? Well, now it's going to be twice as bright. Ben and Tristan are working to solve this by building a fleet of reflective satellites to shine sunlight onto solar farms at night. Great, so all we need is a quarter of a million such satellites a quarter of a million such satellites and focus all of their light onto the same area and you'll get something that's about as bright as sunlight. Fine, whatever. Let's just say you can do that. Now, how much utility are you actually going to get from a spot of sunlight you can only have in one place? As in, how many solar farms actually could utilize something about five kilometers in size? <coughs> Not many and could actually use that sunlight. So let's come to the International Space Station, which is at about the same altitude as these reflector satellites would be. And the first thing that you'll notice is the Earth is mostly covered with water. So, you know, obviously not a lot of solar panels there. And this just gives you some idea of how far these satellites could possibly reflect sunlight. Basically, even if you could launch such a reflector satellite, it's going to spend some 90% of its time doing nothing. But how can this be, I hear you ask? These guys worked for SpaceX. That I kind of realized when I was working at SpaceX is we have rockets figured out very, very well. Um, what we don't have figured out is what we're, the rockets are actually launching. A lot cheaper than moving it on the ground. The economics worked out and I just like kept pushing it. Yeah, I'm gonna have to push extra doubt on that, especially when you're doing calculations like this. You do the math, if we burn everything alive on the planet, it would only last us 3.6 days at our current energy use. So we're just burning like billions and, you know, billions of years of old trees. 3.6 days uh, to burn everything on the planet. You think that's mankind's power consumption? That sounds like copious amounts of bullshit to me. A lot of our work is in math land, figuring out how much money you can make with each satellite. So, you know, like downloading the data set of all the solar farms around the world and then figuring out like- Let's see, all of the fossil fuel that mankind burns puts out some 50 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. Global biomass of carbon, some 500 gigatons. And that's just of carbon. To turn that into carbon dioxide, it's gonna be Eh, whatever, somewhere between that and about three times its mass of carbon dioxide, eh, depending how you cut the math. That is 
enough to keep mankind's energy consumption going for about 10 years. And he gets 10 years to come down to. Do the math. If we burned everything alive on the planet, it would only last us 3.6 days at our current energy use. So whatever, only a factor of 10,000 off. So tell me how you're going to launch these quarter of a million satellites to merely provide one spot of sunlight on the Earth. And we're really able to enter into this space where the rockets have already been figured out. Like, we don't have to go into the business of building rockets, which are ridiculously complicated. Like, huh, Starship, the uh, rocket that's yet to make it to orbit after some, what, four launches? Nobody else has really matched SpaceX in terms of the rockets that they're able to make and the performance that they're able to achieve. Huh, interesting that you would choose the rocket there that has literally zero performance. It's the amazing ability of the Starship to take zero tons of cargo to low Earth orbit. The rocket was entirely empty. But on the bright side, the zero ton payload was accelerated to almost orbital speed by a launch vehicle that then tumbled helplessly through space. And it's like, like, you can just buy a Verizon plan, you don't have to build cell phone towers. And just so we're clear, the fifth launch of the Saturn V not only took men to the moon, it took them on a mock descent for a, a mock landing on the moon. The plan for the fifth launch of Starship is to achieve less than it was meant to achieve on its first flight. That is, to fly in a suborbital trajectory and deliver zero tons of cargo to low Earth orbit. Now, the launch cadence of both these vehicles is about the same. It's just that Apollo progressed from maiden flight to actually taking people down towards the surface of the moon in about a year and a half. Well, Starship evolved from a completely dysfunctional launch vehicle, utterly incapable of landing men on the moon, to merely a dysfunctional launch vehicle, utterly incapable of landing men on the moon in about a year and a half. Ah, but it's going to be designed to be rapidly and fully reusable, said Elon Musk about the Falcon 9 over a decade ago. And in the end, it was never either fully or rapidly reusable. So what exactly makes you think that it's going to work for a more complicated system in a shorter period of time? But if you kind of do the economics out with, with Starship's launch costs, um, you're, you're down at like $30,000 per, per vehicle range, um, which, is, which is really crazy. So, you know, we expect to be able to make these satellites for like around $100,000. Um, you know, if you're launching that on Falcon 9 ride shares, you know, it would cost like $150,000 or so per, per vehicle. Huh, Falcon 9 ride shares, eh? Now, if you drift anywhere around on the net, you'll find fanboys' versions of how SpaceX has completely revolutionized the cost of going to orbit. So let's just compare that for the ride share, shall we? Which is a third of a million dollars, minimalistically, for 50-odd kilos. So that's, at best, $6,000 per kilo, with every additional kilo costing another $6,000. Huh. $6,000 per kilo. That's more expensive than the Saturn V, a non-reusable vehicle from, ah, let's count the decades. Five decades ago, 50 years ago, half a century. Nobody else has really matched SpaceX in terms of the rockets that they're able to make and the performance that they're able to achieve. Okay, so they plan to launch a hundred or so satellites. One spot is actually a composite of like a hundred or so satellites at one time. So rather than being 250,000 times fainter than sunlight, it's only going to be about 2,500 times fainter than sunlight. And their current launch costs, what do they say, are $150,000 per satellite. So to launch these 100 satellites will be some $15 million or so. Maybe double that, including the actual cost of the satellite itself. So for a five kilometer spotlight of real sunlight, you now need to launch the remaining uh, 249,900 satellites. And boom, you'd be good to go at a cost of uh, $37 billion. That's more than the annual budget of NASA. And that's for the launch costs alone. Maybe double that to include the satellites. And at this point, it becomes bloody obvious why no one has ever weaponized this. You know, into something that could destroy any city on Earth once per day. Oh, that's a little bright.
All you would need is a hundred times more satellites than this, and you could put a spot of light 100 times brighter than sunlight on any point on the Earth. All it would require is some 25 million satellites at a cost of about $3 trillion. But in an instant, it would render every other weapon on Earth obsolete. It could destroy as many cities on Earth as you want in a single day. Because we're in space, you can access any panel on the ground with any mirror in space. And you would never have to worry about running out of ammunition again. Because its ammunition supply is the sun. It's not like a helicopter. We have to keep refueling it. Yeah, like it's you put this thing up really high and suddenly you have global access to basically any location on Earth. And it can never go wrong because it's made of mirrors. So it has zero moving parts that can malfunction. <laughs> Other than, of course, the 25 million satellites. 10,000 acres of wooded residential land were scorched in an instant when a laser... Environmentalists call it a disaster. But don't they always? So it would be completely immune to the Kessler syndrome, which is where a couple of satellites crash and at satellite speed being something like a hundred times the speed of a bullet, they create enough shrapnel to basically destroy all of the other satellites in orbit and creating more debris as it goes along. The beauty of space is you can put things up there and they stay up there for a long time. Making Earth orbit a death zone for somewhere between decades and centuries. Now. I wonder why no one's built one. All right, what else we got? 